right, maggots. Drop and give me 50. Eyes front, turns up. It's time to talk leadership styles. Episode 74, Two Chaps, Many Cultures. How does that make you feel inspired? <laughs> I'm not sure if I like that kind of approach. How do you talk to me? I almost felt like I'm back in the military and having to do all these weird things. Can I stand at ease now? Yes, you may. <laughs> Ke Captain Brett, Captain Perry. Drill Sergeant, Drill Sergeant, thank you very much. Oh, you. Uh... <laughs> So today, this is a, a good way to introduce this topic. I didn't expect that to happen. I'm a little bit off, a little caught off guard here. I'm, so, I've got to surprise you sometimes. I've got to surprise you sometimes. We can't. Well, we can't we just do have this, everything man? scripted. <laughs> I've just called our, all, I, I've called our all, all our whole audience maggots. Not a way. Not the best way to start off a um, a two chaps episode, episode seventy four, talking about leadership. Talking about the styles of leadership, how they might be perceived, and how people might react to them. And are they appropriate? How's that set that up? And I'm sorry I called people maggots. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really concerned for the well-being of our audience now. I, mean, I, hope, I hope you guys will discover from, uh, recover from this. So what we will discover, though, is how do we, how do we recognize what way of leading or or instructing or guiding or controlling supervising of groups of people is the best one how what do you think is the best way to lead a group of people well it's cultural as i've discovered <laughs> in my well that yes i i, I think yeah. our audience has kind of gotten used to the fact that we're going to loop that in. Yeah. But I'm curious for Brett Perry growing up in Sydney, Australia, what is the leadership style you're used to? What is the one that was handed to you or embedded in you from the early days? Well, in general, usually the the people I looked up to, the uh, let me let me just say that the best ones that I responded to anyway. I had a very good leader um, when I, in my very, very early career, and uh, he was great. He was, a, he was trusting, he was collaborative, he was interested, he was supportive, he was coach, a, a coach, you know, and, mm. and, and, and as a result, I responded to it. And I, find, I found that a lot of people did respond to um, him positively in that way. And to this day, the people that work for him um you know a, a kind of this little club that we call you know and and i and i always remember that it was very had a big impact on my future professional life so that was kind of i would say in general the australian style is kind of one of the mates but when it comes down to brass tacks we're willing to kind of let somebody take the lead but only when we give it to them if that makes sense because we have kind of a tall poppy syndrome perception there that if you actually come in and you think you've just like I started this episode you start coming in you start shouting at people and you start talking down to them and you start putting yourself above them you, that will kind of give you a little bit of a uh, a, a, a bit of a rough a rough start yeah, I, the, the word that resonated most with me was collaborative so when when and, and you said one of the mates so when we talk about being collaborative and part of a group of what part of the mate sounds like you're part of equal peers. There's no discernible um, cascade of power, right? So it, it everybody at least at surface level shares the same amount of influence and authority. Would that be safe to say? Yep. You pull your pants on the same as me, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, that's how we start the day. And uh, and then, you know, that, that's basically now, how I think in general. Yeah. 
how do you recognize that authority and power has been given to you by your peers? You said, un unless somebody is given that authority in, in your cultural context, how do you know that happened? Well, in, uh, I'll give you an example of a, an, a, 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 an exa um, a client of mine who had been, who was in the UK, had lived in Germany, Italy, and India, and had been a leader, very, very senior leader. And he had gone to Australia and he had found that his historical purview of being a leader in those cultures, which was very hierarchical, where he was treated separate and above um, and granted all this authority just by the fact of his sheer position and title, that went away in Australia. And that was what the, the really what formed the most of my coaching with him was just basically going back to square one and saying it, it, what he found is that he really liked it. He loved the 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 point at which he was kind of now treated as one of the mates, but he was so uncomfortable in it because he hadn't had it that he wasn't sure how to relate to it. And to your very question, he was not sure then what at what point do I now have to step up and be the leader in this group? That was the key point. And mm -hmm. and he, he uh, when we discovered, we actually said, I said, there, there will be a point where they will kind of the, the Aussies will start to come to you for sage advice. They will see you as the person who has the historical uh, experience and the knowledge to do this. You built the trust with them already when they start to come with you and start to actually probably shut their mouth and say, now it's time for you to give us, give it, give us the lead, give us, tell us where to point our arrows. And he had already had this experience, but he just ridden, didn't realize that it had happened. He was still trying to play the two roles. So there, mm. there is a, there is a, there is a key point that that happens, but you have to build that trust. You have to really be, you have to bring yourself down. You have to be humble. You have to be collaborative as, a, as I've said, you have to show that you're willing to listen. And then if you're willing to listen, then there'll be a point where the Aussies will say, okay, all right, time, time for you to pull the boots on and tell us where to go. And I think this is, this is a challenge for many people who come from um, a cultural background that values a clear pecking order, that uh, a clear uh, totem pole, hierarchy, pyramid, whatever metaphor you want to use for distribution of power. For, for people who come from a society where it is, it, as you're part of this group, as you're part of a society, it is inherently understood who has authority and who doesn't and who can grant it to others, or how do you ascend, how do you earn more power and influence more authority. If you're coming from one of those backgrounds and moving to a more egalitarian culture where it is um, less delineated who gets to do what and who calls the shots, that can be a real challenge. I've, I've made that experience myself, right? So I come from a, a culture that is, let's say, a little bit more hierarchical than most Anglo-Saxon cultures. We're not as hierarchical as those cultures that are the poster children for hierarchical societies like Japan or Mexico, for example. Um, but it, it was it was an adjustment uh, period for me as well. And and I mean, I'm, I'm as Brett and I have always made clear in the way we present this information, uh, we want to be very conscious of when we talk about nationalities being a certain way. No Australian is alike and no German, American, Japanese, Mexican, wherever you're from, is a stereotypical person from that country. There's always variances within those cultures in, in, in terms of behavior. However, we can distill certain leadership styles as prototypical. That's how we phrased it in, in the show notes for this episode. And when we look at at prototypes, let's look at the Aussie prototype here. Um, we have an image prepared for you, just for you. Um, Rhett <laughs> says here, and I'm, I'm gonna take out that, that scrolling banner at the bottom because it says here, um, being one of the mates. What does that mean? You're sitting around a table, it's a round table, and there's people symbolized by circles. However, I see mm, the circles don't all have the same size. So, does this illustrate what you just said? You yeah, absolutely. Are yeah. 
peers, but then there is some of some of us are bigger than others. How, how would yeah, you that, describe that? It, it is, yeah, and and so this kind of would say in a in just a typical office setting that if you have your door open, people are going to see the door open and. They might be strolling by with their cup of tea and biscuit and uh, they might just pop in and say, hey, yeah, how you going? You know, like, what's going on? Can we can we have a chat about? And I thought about something else. And there's this kind of like really open relationship that you have with uh, with a boss and maybe even the boss's boss. You know, you're 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 able to if your boss is absent, then you go to the you see the next person up in the hierarchy and you call into their office and. There is, there is, so there's certainly people with bigger titles and responsibilities and, uh, and commitments, but, you know, it, it, pretty much everyone is accessible. And I would go back, you know, you talked about egalitarianism and status. I would also say that I've had many uh, clients say that if they come across a boss, if they come from a hierarchical um, leadership style structure like they've been used to, and they are confronted by a boss who has an open door policy and in and invite and, and is rather friendly with them and congenial and and this kind of thing that also triggers their risk profile right if they, they because they might be more along the certainty that hierarchy that they're used to gives them certainty it knows right. who, who's who in the zoo right they know who to right. go to who it's appropriate and then when they're when they're faced with somebody that says you know, if I'm not here, just go to the next guy up. He'll help you too. And then they freeze because mm -hmm. that's that's outside of their comfort zone. Right. Now let, let's look at um, let's look at the comparison to Germany here, where it says here hierarchy plus consensus. So how I experience it, I'm, I'm going to move outside of that a little bit because I can still talk <laughs> while looking at this. This is awesome. Um, Hello. So how I interpret it for myself is there is a clear chain of command it's clear who is who in the zoo who is the nominal head of the group however the nominal head will unlikely is very unlikely to make decisions without having reached a broad consensus within the group even even though my dot might be that little orange tiny dot on the bottom of this chain of command my voice will still be heard and I'm, I'm, I'm part of this team for a reason because I have a certain skill set or expertise that makes me valuable to the group. So even, even though that, that yellow big ball on top may have the authority to overrule me, they will still listen to me and try to include me in the decision-making process. So consensus building is important. However, it's also clear that there is a, a tiebreaker or a final decision maker um, who's leading this group. So this, this is a leadership concept that requires a leader to, to be engaged and engaging with everybody on the team and, and solicit everybody's input and then weigh that accordingly and, and be basically the, the sorter of information. So how important is this piece? How important is that piece? Okay, let me let me put that together, make a nice puzzle, and present the final picture to the team and say, hey, is everybody on board with this? And if it's a, I don't know, 55 to 45, yay or nay, then that may not be enough for a German leader. They may seek to build a broader consensus. I, I would say in my experience, the rule of thumb is, find a two-thirds, one-third um, consensus base, at least, if not more, because then that would bring everybody or as, as many people as I need as a leader to risk, to be risk comfortable enough to move forward with that decision. Now, as we compare this with leadership styles in the U.S., which I think are in a way fascinating because I always thought that U.S. leadership style is very egalitarian and yet also decisive you see here egalitarian really that, that looks like a little bit of a triangle that looks a little bit like actually three pyramids inverted into each other right so you you have a cascade of power and authority and yet it's here structured individualism i think this is a a concept that took me a while to come to terms with as somebody from outside of the u.s that there are individuals with their individual goals and, and decision-making powers. However, they will 
um, yield power to a nominal superior, a nominal authority um, that is ranking higher than them. And mm -hmm. to, to me, this was a, a, a learning curve that it, it, I'm, I'm still adjusting to, to be honest, after, after all these years, because my, my initial understanding of U.S. culture was, hey, we're all, we're all equal on paper, and we, we're a group of individuals who come together uh, aligned along a common goal, and that, that deference to a higher power, to a higher authority, uh, the, or for me as a German, the lack of consensus building that was necessary to lead efficiently in the U.S., that is sometimes hard for me to deal with. After all these years, I, I want to be part of a consensus and not yeah. be given instructions that I might not agree with. Yeah, and I think some of that goes to the U.S. style, speaks to the kind of the monochronic type of style of even the the siloing and the focus on the job description. So the, the, the power, the power yielding looks like power yielding, but it's a, but it's basically saying, well, it's actually not my job anyway. Like there is a person mm. who is in a higher position that has this job. And if this is my monochronic thinking that I don't want to be, I, I don't want to, you know, it's not that you, it doesn't leave room for creative thinking, but I don't want to step out of my bounds, step out of my lane uh, when there is somebody who has paid and given that power to do that um whereas yeah so that that's a that's a good observation i think that 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 demonstrates it really well um and then you you've got the very i mean there, there is a lot of frustration from western leaders western leaders in in inverted commas but they go to a country like japan very hierarchical where the consent but but still a lot of consensus so i trying to get everybody exactly. on board the namawashi right they've got to they've got to meet everybody's well, needs and let, let me bring this up the, the, this will illustrate it and i will i will remove that, that scrolling banner on the bottom there so hierarchy yes consensus also yes so you look look right. at where japan is on this right so very hierarchical also very consensual and look look where germany is in that in that perspective so you see germany not quite as hierarchical not quite as consensus driven however uh, trending in the japanese direction so to say right. and compare that to the us or to australia much more egalitarian and also more top down right yeah. so the the top down i think is what 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 cultures in that lower right quadrant might might struggle with right i think so it, and again just to get back to your point your valid point before we're talking about countries here only because it's the construct in which we work but every country has its leaders that, that display these uh traits and um and so using you know this might come even from their cultural heritage you know the, how often do we come across somebody who has a, a german family heritage and they display very very german styles but then maybe not you know so it it, it it is fluid it's never absolute um but there is a starting point in all the work we do there the culture is a starting point to perhaps to begin to understand how as a leader you might want to approach an international assignment uh moving to another country or at least even if you're leading and taking uh ownership of the responsibility of operations in different countries, how you're going to manage leaders and how your message might be perceived as it goes down the ladder, right? Yeah, quite quite relevant. So um, I pulled up this image so people still see our face and, and see that graph. So just, just to, in full disclosure, the, the purple images that you saw earlier, those were from Richard D. Lewis's uh, work, uh, a British linguist who, looks at national culture comparisons through the, the lens of language. Um, the, the diagram we're displaying here is from Erin Meyer's book, The Culture Map, where she overlays cultural dimensions in, 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 in a more complex yet more, I think, more nuanced way. So we're not just comparing status versus egalitarianism, we're also comparing consensus versus top down and uh, nation cultures are plotted along that grid, as you can see. And again, careful how much 
absoluteness you want to ascribe to the concept of nation culture. Um, be mindful that there is variance in this. But you can see groups, right? You can see the mm. egalitarian consensual quadrant, which is um, which, which is home to a lot of the European, Nordic, Scandinavian cultures. You can see the top-down egalitarian quadrant that is home to a lot of the Anglo-Saxon cultures. You see the hierarchical top-down more in Asia, South America, and I would also say sub-Saharan, well, Africa in general, Middle East would fall into to that corner mostly. And then I think the, the, the quadrant with hierarchical and consensual, that is probably the least inhabited one of these quadrants. Um, and and I, I personally don't have experience with um, with cultures outside of the three ones that you see pictured here that would fall into that area. Maybe Korea, to a certain degree, might fall into that pocket as well. I'm not so sure about that, though. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think these visualizations help us um, at least... Uh, approach, approximate the, these these abstract concepts a little bit. I don't think any of these models claim um, to be the absolute truth of this. Um, a model, a model that I like to use often when we talk about leadership prototypes is the comparison model of two two sports, two team sports. I know Brett has another one that he'll he'll share in a second. Um, mine mine compares football, American football, with the other football that's actually played with a ball and the feet, so soccer in the United States. So this is uh, comparing two prototypes, and um, you're also seeing two two players that are well-known in their respective field, and they both have the number 25 on their, on their shirts. And yet, even though the name of the game seems so similar, it's the, the pitch on which they play seems similar, and it's not the same. So those of you who've spent time with me in, in, in cultural training programs around leadership across cultures will recognize this model. I'm not going to debrief it here completely, but rest assured that one is a more um, a, a leadership approach in which leaders ascribe um, autonomy in decision making to individual team members and another the other model the other prototype is a, a clear standard operating procedure prescriptive type of leadership which um, is definitely not the same even though both sports both team activities are called football and are played on a rectangular pitch they're not the same and we we use that as a as an explainer metaphor in 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 the workshops that I lead. So what, what's your what's your model, Brett? What, 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 what sports are you using to describe it? Well, I just use the same sport and it is the difference internally in the game of cricket. And uh, and I when I first thought of this, I thought, well, it's a bit bold of me to prescribe a difference in leadership styles in a country that, uh, uh, that I've never lived in, but I know the sport deeply. So my ob observation of two different captaincy styles in the Indian cricket team that uh, a few years back, a gentleman by the name of M.S. Dhoni, a uh, southern Indian, um, very kind of low key, highly accomplished and, uh, and, and very good at his craft, but he was the leader. Uh, and the Indian team did well. They were, they were quite good, um, very accomplished, had great success. He certainly had personal success. Cricket in and of itself is a pretty egalitarian sport. You have a captain, but he really doesn't, you know, he's not the figurehead like a quarterback in a in a uh, in an nfl team but then after him came a, a gentleman by the name of virat Kohli, who was from new delhi now that it might be said that that it, it, that that gives an indication of a little bit more directness um and in the sport itself it displays itself as aggressiveness so as uh, us aussies who are quite proud of our aggressive the way we play cricket all of a sudden we're confronted with a leader who was very aggressive back at us. And of course it influenced the rest of the team. It had an effect on how the whole team played the game. And mm. all of a sudden we were confronted, we were getting kicked in the shins pretty hard by these guys. And they beat us handily on a number of occasions where we had to wake up and say, well, 
we're now playing against a different Indian team. It's the same country, it's the same team, but it's a different leader. And their influence has had a profound, his influence has had a profound effect on the way the team plays the game. And, and so that's just one example. And when I've used that as a metaphor with even many, many Indian clients, they go, that's exactly right. And they're quite, and of course, they're quite proud of Virat. They, they love MS Dhoni as well, but they, they love Virat as well. But it is, it is the recognition of how a leader can impact the, <laughs> the, I even bring it down to sometimes I'll walk into a Starbucks if I'm, you know, I, I, I frequent Starbucks for their cups of tea, not their coffee. But I'll often walk in and I'll and I'll watch the I'm observant of the interaction between the people behind the counter, strangely enough. And I'm watching how friendly they are to the to the customers. And I'm I'm cognizant of this, having a retail background and how this might be influenced by the leader or the owner of that particular franchise. And quite often or not, if I get the chance to meet that owner or franchise manager, I find that what the person is behind the power is what displays behind the counter. It, it It's happened so many times I could probably write a book on it, but it is it is just a, it, it really does bring to bear how just that that influence can be perceived by the clients of a business. This is how impactful it is for the business that it, it, it should be, you should be cognizant of how your style is influencing the way your staff and the, and the people around you uh, present your business to the world. Right, which brings to the awareness uh, that what we talked about so far, uh, cultural comparisons are fine and dandy in describing leadership style preferences. However, we want to make sure that we also look at the personality type. You may find a Japanese leader who is quite um, assertive and top down and defying. We just told you about the Nemawashi consensus that permeates uh, Japanese business culture because that Japanese leader may have done most of his work or her work outside of Japan in, in maybe North America. Maybe they worked for, Toyota of America, and they learn to be a little bit more decisive. Who knows? You might encounter a a German leader who is, uh, I don't know, much more egalitarian and doesn't care about her uh, academic degrees and her official rank and file within the organization, and she'll be one of the mates around the table. So uh, per personality inform that as well. So we want to make sure that we don't reduce this to, to national stereotypes. Now, yeah. it takes an observing eye. It takes a culturally savvy individual to recognize which leadership style will work best with your team. And I've, I've had this so many times with our clients that they, when we talk about all these prototypes and these models, they they come to the conclusion for themselves that they need to be able to flexibly morph into different leadership um, models depending on who in their organization they're dealing with. They might become a much more football quarterback type leader with a certain part of their workforce and become more of a center back soccer player with another portion of their, of their team. And they, need to have the agility and flexibility to to adjust to whatever is thrown at them. So there is not one size that fits all, right? And, and, and having, having that ability is critical. Yep, absolutely. Be willing to wear two pairs of shoes. That's fun too. Yeah, and, and, that'll that'll, and, that'll and make you stand out. Match. <laughs> and socks are no match, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Fine. Why not? But, by the way, I, I want to bring the full disclosure home here. Since I mentioned the books, right? So yeah. this is Richard Lewis. So if you ever come across him, lots of thick stuff here. Find it. You may not agree with everything because I don't, but some of that stuff is really good. And the one is Eric Myers, The Culture Map. So go study, read up. And... Yeah. If you're, if you already read it, or if you don't want to read it, just call Brett. Just call me. We're here. Yeah. We, we do this yeah, we'll, for a living. 
We'll we'll read it to you over the phone, audio book style. <laughs> well, I'll text it to you. I'll send you text messages. You'll text, chapter message, chapter. You'll text the whole chapter. There's a promise I'm for kidding. you. I'm, I'm totally being sidetracked here, but I, I, I know this guy on LinkedIn who creates Instagram accounts where he basically digests whole books in Instagram meme style. So he has like, I don't know, 200 posts on one Instagram account, which is the the digest of one book that he likes. Interesting oh. concept. Um, we're, we're not doing that. However, Brett and I, we do this for a living. So if, if yeah. the leadership questions are painful to you and if you've run into issues there, you know how to find us. Or if you don't, look at the banner. That's where you find That's us. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. Well, that's another one of the Can City Four, Two Chaps, Many Cultures for a Thursday or any day, depending on what day you're listening to us. Please uh, give us your feedback, questions, comments, answers, um, you know, structured arguments, um, abstracts, whatever. Pretty pictures. Paint pictures. Send us anything. We didn't really don't, we'll take it all. <laughs> don't send us your homework. We're not grading that. No, we're not doing your homework for you. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. All right it's man. been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Now, give me 50. All right.